Well, hey, kids, thanks for joining me in part two of our study of this man called the Antichrist. You may have recognized the picture behind me. Most of you do, my grandkids anyway. It's taken from our front yard. Some of you might have noticed in that first video, you can see part of a deer. Did you notice that in the first video? Yeah, she's right behind here. Yeah, you can look at her. <laughs> anyway, God's given us a glorious view from our front yard. We're very thankful for this view. And uh, we praise him and worship him a lot by looking out our window. <laughs> okay, if for some reason you haven't watched part one yet, I would encourage you to do that. Maybe first before you launch into this one. But this is part two of an overview of some of the things that the Bible teaches us about the Antichrist. Last time in part one, we looked at scriptures that I personally believe teach us that the appearance of the Antichrist is a sign that the events of the end times are upon us, that he blasphemes God, that his real power comes from Satan himself, that humanly he uses intrigue and his apparently peaceful intentions with a small group of people to gain power. Apparently he will have been supernaturally brought back to life after being killed. Most of the people in the world will be amazed by him and they will follow him and even worship him. He'll be fiercely opposed to God's people, though, and will persecute God's people intensely. We learned that the time of his power is very limited, and we learned that he will attempt to control the world with his economic plan. So here's the next point, and I mentioned this last time, but I want to spend a little more time on it. True Christians will absolutely refuse to participate in his plan because they know that to do so, they would have to renounce our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way you can participate in the Antichrist kingdom. In Revelation 20, verse four, we read, then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, listen to this, for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast, in other words, this is after the tribulation, or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. So they'd been killed during the reign of the Antichrist, but they never did worship him. And then it says they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's what we call the millennium. Verse five says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This, God says, is the first resurrection. Back in chapter seven of Revelation, verse nine, we read this, after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Let's give on down to verse 13. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes? From where have they come? I said, sir, you know, and he answers. He says, he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Of course, many will be put to death for their decision to be true to Jesus Christ. They will be martyred, but we just have to keep it in our minds. That's not a big deal. That's a temporary problem. <laughs> Jesus has taken away the sting of death for all of us Christians. We don't ever need to be afraid of it. It's a defeated enemy. <laughs> God's gonna raise us back up after he's destroyed the Antichrist. Makes that clear what we read just a few minutes ago. I think it's also significant, if I can chase this rabbit just a little bit, in Revelation chapter 20, what we read a few minutes ago, God calls this resurrection, and it's a resurrection that obviously happens after the great tribulation. He calls it the first resurrection. Seems to me at least that if Christians are gonna be raised before the reign of the Antichrist, that this resurrection referred to in Revelation 20 would not likely be called the first resurrection. I could be wrong. Just what it seems logical to me. 
And it seems that while the Antichrist power covers the whole earth, you know, just a casual observer, you think, wow, he's got control of everything. There are going to be many, many Christians, maybe scattered out, maybe here and there, maybe some of them living in some of the smaller, out of the way communities of the world. But they're not going to renounce their Lord, Jesus Christ. They're not going to worship that beast. And many of them will be killed, yes. But others of them, we can tell by reading the scriptures, are obviously going to survive until the Lord comes back. So some Christians will survive the Great Tribulation without receiving the mark of the beast. What does that mean? Well, it's possible. I don't want to go too far with this. And I may be going a little bit too far. But maybe there's a truth here that Christians who have the resources to do so, and Christians in different parts of the world may have resources to do this, might be able to give some thought and make some practical preparations so that they could live physically for a time without pledging allegiance to the Antichrist. In other words, they wouldn't receive his mark. They wouldn't be able to participate in the economy. But they could bear witness to the power of the Lord Jesus for a while at least. He would choose the time. You know, he always chooses our time here on this earth, but up even during the reign of the Antichrist. It's at least possible, I think, and seems reasonable to me, that the reason God's given us so much instruction about the end times, at least one of the reasons, is that Christians who have the resources can study his word, recognize the end times as they approach them, maybe make some preparations. And for some, again, who have the right resources, these preparations could conceivably involve preparations to survive on in their physical bodies for a while in the Antichrist reign even. It might not be feasible for most of us, but certainly for all of us, it involves spiritual preparation and emotional preparation for the kind of times of persecution and martyrdom that will be going on during the tribulation. Okay, here's the next one. During the Antichrist reign, many Christians will be used by God to instruct others until their time is completed. Daniel chapter 11, verse 33, we read, And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help. So this is another reason Christians should become prepared to fight a good fight as long as they live in the, in, during the reign of the Antichrist. You know, we don't know what our time period is. God's told us he will use those who understand, though, to instruct others during this terrible time. And he'll provide supernatural help as needed for these Christians to continue to serve him until he's through with them. But, of course, we're not going to be able to instruct others if we ourselves are not well equipped with the knowledge of God's word. That's why we have to be students of God's word our whole lives long. We got to keep on studying. Don't be satisfied with where you are. Keep growing stronger in understanding God's word. And we need to use the time we've got right now and the resources we've got right now, incredible resources, even on our cell phones, to become equipped and prepared students of scriptures. Okay, here's another point. I alluded to this one earlier. The Antichrist will team up with a powerful spiritual advisor. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, we read, Then I saw another beast rising up out of the earth, in addition to the Antichrist. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist, in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs it is allowed to work, in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. So here God's describing a false prophet. We sometimes call this person the false prophet. He will have amazing supernatural powers. And because of those powers, people who are not Christians will be astounded, overwhelmed at the amazing powers demonstrated by the Antichrist and this close spiritual advisor of his. It'll be very easy 
for those who reject Jesus Christ to be horribly deceived. Jesus said, uh, even the elect would be deceived if that were such a thing were possible. God will keep us from being deceived. It's very easy for those who don't know Jesus to be deceived. Here's the next one. The Antichrist will participate in some kind of alliance with 10 other rulers, three of whom he will overthrow. So in Revelation 13, verse 1, we see, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with 10 horns. And he's going to explain those horns a little later. 10 horns and seven heads with 10 diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 3, we read, He carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. A little bit farther down in that same chapter, in verse 7, the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. Skip on down to verse 12. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings. So he tells us what they are. Who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, a short time, together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. Daniel talks about this in chapter seven. After this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had, here we go again, 10 horns. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Blasphemies. We've seen that already. He mentions those 10 horns again down in verse 20. He says, and about the 10 horns that were on his head and the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn that had the eyes and the mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than his companions. So he's underlining it there in verse 20. And he explains it in verse 24. As for the 10 horns out of this kingdom, 10 kings, there it is again, 10 kings shall rise and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. Now, again, it's impossible for us to predict in advance exactly who these kings might be ahead of time. A lot of people have tried to do that. It may be a fun experiment for some people and ex exercise in their mental ability to try to be creative. <laughs> The point is that when these things do come to pass, those who are familiar with God's word and who are familiar with these prophecies will recognize the fulfillment of them. And when these events do come to pass, they'll help people recognize beyond question who this man really is. <laughs> Here's the next point. Eventually, he will no longer need the false prophet, the false religion that helped him consolidate his power, and he'll destroy it. Revelation chapter 17, verse 3, he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman. In verse 1, she's called the great prostitute. And this woman is basically a metaphor for false religion. God often calls worshiping other gods spiritual adultery. I'm sure you remember that. Here's this woman, this prostitute, sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and it had seven heads and ten horns. So this woman is with the Antichrist here. In verse 7, he says, But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. And in verse 16, he says, The ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will hate the prostitute. They will turn on this false religion. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. So at that point, it'll become clear to everybody, even those who are worshiping the beast, that the religion, quote unquote, and the miracles, they were just satanic tools that the Antichrist was using to achieve his total control over all the unbelievers of the world. Here's the next point. 
the Antichrist will be greatly hampered by two of God's very powerful servants until the Antichrist has them put to death. It's in Revelation chapter 11. God says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days. Again, that's three and a half years. Clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They had the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. They had the power over the waters to turn them into blood, to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they finish their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, the Antichrist, will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. So it seems like the beast wins a victory. Notice that these two servants of God can't be hurt. Did you notice that? Until God's finished with them. God's using them during this time to bear witness to his truth and his power. And nothing can hurt them until God's finished with them. That's true for all of us, by the way. But then and only then does God allow them to be killed by the Antichrist. Of course, that's not the end of them. We know that. God's going to raise them back up to life. Tells us that right here. He'll raise all of us back to life. All of his kids. All right, here's another thing about the Antichrist. He will seat himself as if he were God in the temple of God. And we've seen these verses before, but we're focusing here on the temple part. It's just part of his blasphemous behavior. You know, we've seen already he's, he's blasphemes against God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 again. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. Listen to this now. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God. In the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. In Revelation chapter 11. John says, I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure that, look, the temple of God, the temple of God, and the altar, and those who worship there, but do not measure the, the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it's given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. In Daniel chapter 9, we read, he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, in this case, a week of years, that'd be seven years. And for half the week, that would be three and a half years, half of seven, for half the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. By the way, the reason that Orthodox Jews do not offer sacrifices today, and they have not offered sacrifices since 70 AD, is because they don't have a temple. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and since then they have not had a temple to offer sacrifices. So this implies here, when we read these things, that they do have a temple at this point. And then Daniel said, on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Chapter 11, verse 31, Daniel says, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. And we talked about this in the last uh, video. We might say, well, he's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. Yes, but he's, he's going beyond Antiochus Epiphanes to the Antichrist. We'll see that in just a minute. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. From the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there should be 1290 days. That's three and a half years again, plus one more month in this case. And then look at this. When we get to Matthew chapter 24 in the New Testament, this is Jesus speaking in his great, what we call the Olivet Discourse, talking about the end times. He says in verse 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation, and in case there's any doubt what he's talking about, he makes it very clear, he specifies it, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. 
So it seems clear that there's a temple that God's talking about going, that's being discussed here in, in these tribulation times. Now, I need to say a lot of Bible students see this temple as symbolic. And they will point out that, wait a minute, in the New Testament, no building is ever going to be the temple of God again, because God now dwells inside us, right? Our bodies are called his temples, right? Yes. And the church as a body of believers is called his temple. There are other Bible students who say, well, it was a literal temple, but this stuff's already occurred. These are historical events. This is not prophecies of the end times. These things happened many centuries ago. And I realize, guys, these people could be correct. I could be wrong. But I personally am inclined to take these verses more literally and believe that before the end comes, God will allow Israel to rebuild a temple, which will be a physical building which Orthodox Jews will dedicate to God. Of course, they'll be horrified when the man of sin uses it to try to prove that he himself is the only God there really is. Sets up the abomination of desolation in the, in the holy place. Okay, here's the next one. When Christ returns to reign, the Antichrist will resist him, <laughs> but the Antichrist will be destroyed. And I laugh because I, I, I just think there's a little humor in this. I know it sounds horrific, but listen, listen to this. And then the lawless one will be revealed. We're back in Second Thessalonians. The lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill. How? With the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. <laughs> Not much of a battle. <laughs> The Antichrist may seem really terrifying and intimidating to the whole world, but all has, Jesus has to do when he comes back to defeat him is, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> He's dead. <laughs> Revelation 19 gives us a little more detail, verses 19 and 20. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. Talking about Jesus coming back. And the beast was captured. <laughs> And with it, the false prophet, who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Not much of a battle. Daniel 8 says, by his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many. And he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. And he shall be broken, but by no human hand. Jesus is going to take care of it. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that you saw was and is not is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go where eventually? To destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life and the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and it is not and is to come. But he's headed for destruction. 1711, as for the beast that was and is not, and is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, it goes to destruction. <laughs> I believe Christians living during these times of the times of the Antichrist will take great courage from words like this. The Antichrist may seem terrifying. He may seem awesomely, overwhelmingly powerful at that moment. But they will know if they're familiar with these scriptures, his time is very limited. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and is easily going to destroy him. Okay, let's wrap this thing up. <laughs> there are other things God does teach us in his word about the Antichrist. We've not covered all of it. He gives us more details that will help Christians identify him and the progress of his three and a half year reign of terror. And you can learn more of this yourself if you want to. Just get Daniel and read chapters 7, 8, and 11, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and maybe Revelation chapters 13 through 20, Matthew chapter 24. You may want to launch your own study of some of these chapters. If you want me to help you, let me know. Just remember, don't be intimidated away from reading these passages just, be, just because we can't understand it all, or just because we can't agree about what the details may mean. I think God wants us to study his word, even if we can't understand it. We said this already. 
Y'all remember Isaac Newton? I bet you studied Isaac Newton in science classes. He happens to be one of the most brilliant men who ever lived. He was a great scientist. By the way, <laughs> those of you who hate math, Isaac Newton's the one who invented calculus. So he could describe the motions associated with the forces of gravitation, you know, force of gravitation. You know, he, he was an amazing guy. Brilliant. <laughs> but he also had a great respect for the Bible and he loved to study the Bible. He was a student of God's word. By the way, he happened to be a post-tribulationist for what that's worth. <laughs> Newton once wrote these words about Bible prophecies though. And I think whatever your position is, they have a lot of wisdom. I, I just believe these are wise words. Newton said, God gave us these prophecies not to gratify men's curiosity by enabling them to foreknow things, but that after they were fulfilled, they might be interpreted by the event. And God's own providence, not the interpreters, be thereby manifested to the world. In other words, God's getting glory when these things take place. So Christians need to be familiar with these prophecies, not to satisfy our curiosity about the future, but so that when they begin to unfold before our eyes, we will see God's hand at work in history and in prophecy and understand what we need to understand and give glory to him. <laughs> Meanwhile, we can learn enough from them to be prepared. I believe the Bible teaches that a time of great tribulation is on the way. I believe there's a brief but intense time of great worldwide persecution on the children of God. And I believe it's on the way. And I believe we Christians need to be as prepared as we can get. But listen to me, guys. And this is very, very important. Sometimes movies and books are written in such a way that they create fear in your heart. Mm -mm. That's not the way God gives us these things. He doesn't give us these things so we'll be afraid. He tells us these things so we won't be afraid. We must never let our imaginations and use these things that God's put in his word to, to cause fear in our hearts. Listen, God's not giving us a spirit of fear. And you know what? <laughs> He's given us a beautiful analogy that almost all of us can identify with one way or another that helps us with this, I think. When a young married woman gets pregnant, it's going to be about nine months before that baby comes. But she doesn't spend all of her days fearful because she knows there's coming a time of intense labor contractions. She knows they're on the way. <laughs> she knows there's going, there's going to be some contractions, but she's looking forward to her baby. She's excited. Oh, she knows she's going to have to endure some labor. She knows the contractions are coming. She does. But she knows God will give her the grace to get through that, just as he's given grace to millions of other mothers. So whilst maybe she does do some things to prepare for the labor, nothing wrong with that, but her main focus is not on the labor. She's going to have a baby. <laughs> it's incredibly exciting. Well, it's the same thing with us. We Christians know Jesus is coming back. And that's incredibly exciting to us. It should be. And yes, we may have to endure some labor contractions between now and then. We know that. And we also know God's going to give us the grace we need for that. So we're not terribly worried about it. The main thing is our Lord Jesus is coming back and we're going to rise up to meet him. And whatever happens between now and then, by his grace, we're going to live with him forever. Jesus never, ever promised that we would escape tribulation. He didn't. He did promise us victory over it, though. And so I want to conclude this little study with some of what I think are some of the most encouraging words Jesus ever spoke to us, his church. It's in the Gospel of John. And very appropriately, he spoke them on the night before his crucifixion. I bet you've memorized this. If you haven't, you need to. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Isn't that good? Of course it's good. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
that because of Jesus, we have victory. And we don't have to be afraid of the Antichrist. We don't have to be afraid of the tribulation. We don't have to be afraid of any suffering, any man, any demon. We don't have to be afraid of Satan because in Christ, you've given us victory. Yes, Lord, we know that we may go through some labor contractions, some things that will not be terribly pleasant, but we know that we're going to come out on the other side in great glory with you. So thank you for giving us this assurance. Thank you for giving us these things so that we can recognize the end times when we enter them. And thank you, Lord, that you've given us all this incredible confidence that you are going to win every battle. <laughs> in Jesus Christ, we have total victory. We praise you through Jesus' name. Amen.